Hey heroes, welcome to another suspenseful episode of History of the Marvel Universe. This channel is sponsored in part by Patreon supporters. If you would like to contribute and vote in monthly polls, then you can sign up for an amount of your choosing over at patreon.com slash marymarvelite. The link is in the description below along with other places you can find me. This week we're looking at another selection of strange stories from before the Marvel Age of Heroes. Let's begin with one from 1950's Journey into Unknown Worlds titled The Strange Car. This tale begins with a thief named Earl Rawls, who made his living stealing cars and selling them to a local crime syndicate. One day he noticed a unique vehicle owned by a short, peculiar looking man. Assuming it to be a foreign model, he attempted to get a closer look only for the owner to ignore his questions and drive away. Despite the quickness of his departure, Earl couldn't help but note that the smaller man's movements were strange, like his clothes didn't properly fit his body, and his face seemed stiff and lifeless as if it were a mask. Earl Rawls went about his business, but several days later he came upon the unmistakable car once again. With the door unlocked and the owner nowhere in sight, the wily thief casually slipped inside to get a feel for the interior. While he was doing so, the car's owner emerged from a nearby building and yelled at him to get out. In a panic, Earl acted instinctively and pressed the button that he believed would start the vehicle. While he guessed correctly, he soon found himself transported into some other dimensional realm. There, he encountered a hostile alien race who revealed the truth of the strange car. The denizens of that reality were aware of Earth for some time, but it had taken centuries of effort for them to create a single prototype vehicle capable of traveling there. Offended by the very idea of Earth existing alongside them, these aliens plotted to use their machine to learn what they needed to know to wipe out humanity. Fortunately for the planet, Earl was able to slip from the aliens' grasp and use their own vehicle to return to Earth. Once he arrived, he set fire to the strange car, knowing he needed to stop the aliens from using it any further. As the masked alien spy rushed towards his vehicle, the interdimensional automobile exploded, taking its owner out with it. Earl was quickly arrested for starting the fire and accepted his imprisonment, not even attempting to explain his bizarre experience. Instead, he simply took solace in the knowledge that he had saved the world and vowed never to steal another car for as long as he lived. Next, we have an adventure into terror from 1951 titled The Hands of Murder. This story stars a woman named Trudy Marshall and her abusive older sister, Janet. Janet was pathologically jealous of her younger sister and lashed out whenever Trudy had something that she didn't. In one incident, Janet attacked Trudy and stole a ring that their mother had given her as a birthday present. This sort of thing continued even after their father passed away, leaving a considerable fortune to both women. One day Trudy decided to spend some of her money on a new dress, but knew that she would have to hide it from her sister. However, Janet took notice of this and snuck into her sister's closet with a knife, using it to slash the fabric to pieces. When she heard her sister approaching, Janet hid in a dark corner of the closet with the door closed. However, Trudy, not realizing that Janet was inside, simply locked the closet door before leaving the house. She returned several hours later to find that in her absence, Janet had suffocated and died. After that, Trudy began to have terrible nightmares of her sister's ghostly form rising to strangle her. Even while awake, she could feel Janet's hand closing around her throat, and confided in her doctor, Frank Phillips. He concluded that there was nothing medically wrong with her, and decided to assuage her fears by taking an x-ray of her neck. He sent her home while the pictures developed, but that night he got a call from Trudy's mother, who claimed that Trudy was actually choking. 
He rushed over and tried to convince her to calm down and breathe normally, as he could find no sign of anything physically preventing her from doing so. He hoped the developed x-rays would convince her of this and rushed downstairs to retrieve them from his bag. However, his efforts were in vain as by the time he returned, Trudy was stumbling towards the window of her high-rise apartment. She turned and looked at him, but it seemed as though she was momentarily lifted by some invisible force that threw her to the pavement below. Dr. Phillips and Mrs. Marshall could only watch on helplessly as Trudy hit the sidewalk and perished on impact. The doctor lamented that he didn't have the opportunity to present the results of the x-ray to Trudy, but then he and Marshall noticed something disturbing in the image. A skeletal human hand that was clamped around her throat, still wearing the ring that Janet had stolen from Trudy. Next, from the pages of Astonishing, we have a story called The Hanging Terror. This tale begins with a British astronomer named Albert Bell, who discovered a new satellite suspended between the Earth and the Moon. He shared his findings with an American physicist, Carl Velleur, and based on its cubical shape, the two determined that the object must have been man-made. Fearful of a potential alien invasion, the two colleagues conferred with yet another man, Major Vincent Crocker of the U.S. Army. This kicked off a military investigation, and it was determined that the satellite was actually a secret Soviet space station. Determined to destroy the base, the American military tasked one of its top engineers, Colonel Hank Storm, with designing a gun capable of doing the job. Nearly three years later, on May 3rd of 1945, construction of the cannon was completed in a secret base in Arizona. But before it was fired, Bell and Vleur leaked information about the weapon that eventually reached behind the Iron Curtain. Learning of the cannon, the Soviets dispatched their agents to infiltrate the base and steal the weapon on August 5th, 1945. Within 24 hours, they brought the gun to their orbital space station and prepared to test it by firing on the United States. But as it turns out, the information leak had been a trap, and when the Soviets attempted to fire the weapon, the cannon backfired, destroying the station and itself. The resulting shockwave caused several tremors across the planet, and when the government covered up the existence of the Soviet station, those quakes were attributed to the bombing of Hiroshima, which occurred around the same time. It's unconfirmed what happened to Crocker, Vleur, Storm, and Bell, but it has been posited that the four men went with the cannon when it was taken, sacrificing their own lives to ensure that their plan worked. Next up, we have a journey into mystery from 1953 called Paid in Full. This tale features a man known as Brute Freden, who worked as an enforcer for the Crane Collection Agency. Enjoying his brutal job a little too much, Freden was always eager to rough people up. As such, his boss sent him to intimidate a man who'd repeatedly failed to pay back his debts, Henry Green. True to his name, Brute Freden threatened the old man, declaring that he'd have to get the money by whatever means necessary, or else he'd have to face the consequences the following morning. However, Green had spent every penny he'd borrowed on medical treatments for his sick wife. Satisfied that he'd gotten the message across, Freden departed to drink at a nearby bar. By the time he left, night had fallen, and Freyden decided to pay Green another visit, just to witness his terror one more time. But as he made his way there, a figure approached from behind, brandishing a kitchen knife. With the night too dark to see clearly, the drunken brute was taken completely by surprise, and fatally stabbed in the back. The following morning, Henry Green sat by the window, waiting for the debt collector to arrive and nervously lamenting the fact that he had to kill someone to get the necessary money. 
For our next Marvel tale, we have a story that posits the question, what would you do? This yarn begins on July 7th, 1951, with a couple who worked in a traveling circus, Harry Matlack and Diane Gordon. The two planned to marry, but the juggler, Ted Roto, had an unhealthy obsession with Diane. His brother, Jerry, tried to dissuade him from bothering her, but as time passed, Ted only grew more unhinged. One day, Harry was doing his job as the carnival barker, calling people to see the juggling twins, but the Roto brothers were running late. Harry went to investigate when he heard a scream coming from Diane's tent. Rushing inside, he saw Ted trying to convince Diane to kiss him, while Jerry attempted to hold him back. Harry jumped in to intervene, striking Ted and declaring that if it weren't for Jerry, he'd beat him to death. Jerry tried to drag his brother away, promising Harry that Ted wouldn't try something like that again. However, the owner of the circus then burst onto the scene, declaring that the brothers were late and needed to perform their act right away. The two agreed, and Harry was also forced to announce them again, taking solace in the knowledge that he and Diane would be leaving to marry the following day. Ted was unwilling to let that happen, however, and while he and his brother were juggling razor-sharp knives, Ted Roto threw one at Harry, striking him in the back and killing him almost instantly. Clearly witnessed by the crowd, Ted was arrested, but was convinced that he couldn't be prosecuted. And indeed, although the jury voted to convict, the judge presiding over Ted's trial was unsure of how to sentence him without unjustly punishing his brother. You see, the problem was that Ted and Jerry Roto were inseparable, conjoined twins. Next, from the pages of Mystery Tales, we have a 1955 story called The Census Taker. This story begins on a warm summer afternoon when a man named Ben Brand was visited by a peculiar census taker. This strange man, later identified as Nigli Azio, referred to Brand as a member of the Two-Eyed Class and asked how many slave robots his family owned. When a confused Benjamin answered with none, the census taker insisted that it was illegal to force his wife and child to perform menial tasks like cleaning dishes. Azio continued with more nonsensical questions like how many gravity cars the family owned or how much space travel they engaged in the previous year. Increasingly convinced that the census taker was a fake, Ben Brand bluffed his way through the line of questioning for his own safety until Azio left. About an hour later, he went out to pick up groceries, but when he returned, there was a notice on his door ordering him to report for sentencing due to his violation. He dismissed and ignored this summons as nonsense, but then, an hour after that, Azio returned with his own slave robot, Statha. He declared that Brand would serve time on a penal asteroid, but the man had had enough and demanded to check Azio's credentials. He called the Census Bureau, and when Azio took the phone himself to speak to them, he began to suspect that he'd made an error. It seems that while he was on his way to a moon called Caligo, Azio had taken a nap and let his slave robot take the controls. Unfortunately, Statha wasn't exactly programmed for astro-navigation, and so the census taker finally realized that he was on the wrong planet entirely. Next, from 1956's Mystic No. 43, we have a terrifying tale called In the Dark. This story features a man named Ben Darrow, who worked underground for the Blackfield Construction Company. Growing tired of his life as a sand hog, one night he stole $12,000 from the company payroll and hid it in his empty lunchbox. Deciding to wait before quitting to throw off suspicion, when the other workers arrived the following morning, he sneaked out of his hiding spot and joined the group, pretending to have arrived alongside them. Part of him wished that he could share the money with his compatriots, but ultimately elected to put his needs above the others. 
and so as he headed underground to work his final shift, he placed his lunchbox alongside the others. However, during that shift, something went wrong, and the cave they were working in threatened to collapse. While the other men evacuated, Bandero ran back into the tunnel towards the cave where the lunchboxes were stored. He frantically searched through the boxes, unable to find his own as the lights went out around him. Alone in the darkness, he realized that the entrance to the cave had collapsed, leaving him trapped. Fortunately, after locating a lantern, he was able to find a phone and contact the men outside. He learned that it would take them a full week to rescue him, and was warned that he would have to carefully ration his food and water. Ben was confident that he could survive and escape with the stolen payroll, given the number of lunchboxes in the chamber. But when he began inspecting them, it seemed as though his fleeting wish to spread his wealth had come true at an inopportune time. He began opening box after box, only to realize that each and every one of them was filled with money, and there was not a portion of food or drop of water to be found. Next, we have a spellbinding story from 1957 called Something in the Bottle. This tale features an untidy man named Michael Scanlon, who had feelings for a woman named Peg and wanted to marry her. The thing is, Peg liked Michael back, but was unwilling to tie herself down with a shiftless man who refused to clean himself up and even attempt to look for work and so she pursued other romantic interests, kicking Michael back out onto the street. As he returned to his vagrancy, he came upon a glass bottle in the trash that seemed to have something inside. Popping the cork out of curiosity, Michael Scanlon came face to face with a real, magical genie. By its own admission, this genie was one of lesser power, who was only capable of granting a single wish every year. This was good enough for Michael, who wished that he could sweep Peg off her feet. With that, Peg appeared shortly thereafter, having left her boyfriend to admit her love for Michael. But despite the genie's wish while her heart pined for him, her head cautioned her against marrying him right away. And so she agreed to give him a chance to change up his ways and clean up his act, insisting that she would consider marrying him after he worked a steady job for a full year. This time, Michael agreed, secretly planning to use the genie again in a year's time to make himself wealthy enough to retire young. And so he did exactly what Peg wanted of him, cleaning himself up and finding a well-paying job that he worked hard at over the following months. He kept the genie's bottle on his bedside dresser, eagerly awaiting the day that he could use it again. As the allotted time counted down, Peg was so impressed by the way that Michael had turned his life around, she did agree to marry him. And the day before the wedding, she came to Michael's apartment to clean up while he was at work. This was the very same day that the genie was finally able to grant another wish, but as Michael excitedly returned home, he found that his tidy bride-to-be had thrown out the dirty old bottle. For our final story of the week, we have a strange tale simply called The Invaders. This yarn features a rogue group of undersea dwellers led by two men, Garth and Rule, who wished to invade and conquer the surface world. The two led a scouting party to the surface, making landfall beside a relatively remote coastal farm. They entered the first house they found, eager for the humans within to cringe in terror. However, much to their surprise, the old woman who lived there simply berated them for stepping on her flower beds. The invaders were even more shocked when the woman declared that the town never should have allowed them to come. When Rule inquired further, she indicated that they indeed had been ready for their arrival for weeks. Furthermore, the old woman declared that the visitors would be welcome if they behaved themselves, otherwise they would be dealt with. Her lack of fear confused the invaders, causing Garth and Rule to second-guess their plans. 
Before they could really decide what to do, they saw a vehicle approaching in the distance and feared it might be a weapon of some sort. Erring on the side of caution, the invaders fled back to the sea, abandoning their conquest of the surface. The vehicle they saw, however, was simply an old Ford Model T, being driven by the woman's husband, who was surprised to hear that their expected visitors had arrived a day early. The woman shrugged it off, but lamented the fact that they'd agree to allow a Hollywood studio to film there in the first place. Alright heroes, that is all I have for you this week, and thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and share it on your favorite social media. As always, the issues referenced in this video are listed in the description below if you would like to read to them for yourself, as well as links to other places you can find me. Let me give a special shout out to all of my Patreon and Ko-fi supporters, Twitch subscribers, and YouTube members who help make the channel possible. By signing up for any ongoing amount on any of these platforms, you can get your name in these special thanks here, but Patreon is the one that helps determine what topics get covered on the channel via monthly polls. And if there's anything in particular that you want me to talk about, be sure to let me know in the comments. But that is indeed all I have for you this week, and so until next time, true believers, Excelsior!